In the previous lesson, we looked at normal shock waves. In real life, these normal shocks are a limiting case and occur rather infrequently. In fact, due to the shape of the body, most shocks that occur in supersonic flows over objects are inclined at an angle relative to the incoming flow. Such shocks are called oblique shock waves and are the focus of this lesson. Oblique shocks generally occur when the supersonic flow is turned onto itself. Let us understand this by looking at an illustration. Consider a supersonic flow over a surface. If a ramp is added to the surface at an angle theta such that the surface and the ramp make a concave corner, the incoming supersonic flow gets deflected. This deflection is towards the bulk flow, that is, the flow is turned onto itself. To ensure that the supersonic flow is informed about the presence of the ramp, an oblique shock wave is formed through which the flow gets deflected at the same angle as the deflecting surface and becomes parallel to the wall. Let us now mathematically describe the flow through an oblique shock wave. Consider an oblique shock wave oriented at an angle beta to the incoming supersonic flow, which is at a Mach number of m1. The equivalent velocity is v1. This velocity can be represented as a superposition of two components a velocity component which is normal to the shock that is u1 and a velocity component parallel to the shock which is vt1. The relationship between v1 and the velocity components is shown here. Furthermore, the two velocity components are related to the oblique shock wave angle using the given relationship. It is easy to show that the continuity equation assuming a steady flow, that is, there is no change of properties with time, can be transferred to the following form where u2 is the downstream shock normal velocity. The tangential component of the momentum equation with a steady flow and no boundary force assumption can be transformed to the equation shown here. Manipulating this equation using the continuity equation, we get that Vt1 is equal to Vt2, that is, the shock parallel velocity component is the same upstream and downstream of an oblique shock. The normal component of the momentum equation and the energy equation take the following forms for an oblique shock wave. If we observe closely, the governing equations of the flow through an oblique shock wave are dependent only on the shock normal velocity, that is u1 and u2. This means that all the theory developed for estimating flow properties through a normal shock wave in the previous lesson will hold as is for an oblique shock. The only difference being that for the upstream Mach number, we use the shock normal Mach number which is shown below. For an oblique shock, the variation of flow properties across the shock is given by the following relations. In these relations, if you substitute for beta as pi by 2, the exact normal shock wave relations will be recovered. This basically indicates that the normal shock waves are just a unique case of oblique shocks when the shock wave angle is equal to pi by 2. The Mach number downstream of an oblique shock wave is given by the following equation. From the velocity triangles upstream and downstream of the shock, we have the following relationships. Combining these relations with the continuity equation and the density ratio across the oblique shock, we can write an expression connecting the deflection angle, the shock angle and the Mach number upstream of the shock wave as shown here.
This is the very famous theta beta Mach number relation. The curves obtained from this relation are shown here. There are quite a few observations that can be made from these curves. Let's look at them one by one. For any given upstream Mach number, there exists a unique maximum deflection angle that is theta max. We will discuss what happens if the theta is greater than theta max in a little bit. For a given upstream Mach number and for all the deflection angles less than theta max, there are always two solutions for the shock angle beta. The larger value of beta is called the strong shock solution and the smaller value is called the weak shock solution. For the strong solution, the Mach number behind the shock is always subsonic. On the other hand, for the weak solution, which is more common in nature, the Mach number behind the shock is supersonic except when theta is very close to theta max. A strong shock solution can be generated if the back pressure behind the shock is increased by an external mechanism. As discussed earlier, at theta is equal to zero, beta takes the value of pi by two, which is nothing but a normal shock. Or beta can also take the value of mu, resulting in a weak shock solution, often referred to as the Mach wave. For a fixed value of deflection angle theta, the weak solution shock angle is inversely proportional to the upstream Mach number. At upstream supersonic Mach number below which no weak solutions are possible, the deflection angle will correspond to the maximum possible deflection at this Mach number. Going further below this Mach number will result in a shock that is not attached to the object anymore and is called the detached shock. As mentioned earlier, when theta is equal to zero, the weak shock solution is that of a wave referred to as the Mach wave. It is basically an infinitely weak oblique shock wave through which the pressure jump is zero. Therefore, from the pressure ratio relation, it is easy to define the Mach angle mu as shown here. At any point P in the flow field, there are two Mach lines, one positive and the other negative, which intersect a streamline at an angle mu in 2D. In 3D, Mach lines form a conical surface. Let's switch gears a little. Till now, we have looked at an oblique shock wave formed at a sharp concave corner. What happens if the corner is not sharp but smooth as shown in this figure? Well, for this type of geometry, we will notice the formation of weak Mach waves at different points along the curve. These Mach waves then coalesce at a point and form an oblique shock wave. This is for a case where the radius of curvature of the curved corner is constant. For real world geometries, it is possible for the radius to vary along the curve. In such a situation, the flow can be extremely complex with the formation and interaction of shock and expansion waves. If you recall from the theta beta Mach number chart, we saw that for a given Mach number, there is a maximum value of theta that is possible for the flow to turn. What if the deflection angle is greater than this maximum? In such a case, the shock wave will no longer be attached to the object, but instead will move upstream and form a detached curved shock, also known as a bow shock. The flow behind the shock will be subsonic near the corner and slowly accelerate to supersonic further down the surface. One thing to remember here is that the value of theta max 
is directly proportional to the upstream Mach number. That is, the higher the incoming Mach number, the higher will be the possible deflection angle for creating an oblique shock. Detached shocks are quite common since most supersonically traveling bodies have a blunt nose cone. Here is an illustration of a detached bow shock in front of a blunt body. This bow shock is a blend of normal, oblique and weak shocks. Let's now look at different regions of this bow shock. We will also have the theta beta Mach number chart handy for reference. At point zero as seen on the chart, the upstream flow is normal to the bow shock and therefore this point corresponds to a normal shock wave. Between points zero and two, a strong oblique shock wave exists and the flow behind the shock is subsonic. The angle of inclination of the wave in this region can be got from the theta beta Mach number chart from the strong wave solution section. Point two corresponds to the separation point between the strong and the weak solutions. Point three corresponds to the location on the shock where the flow behind the shock is sonic. Between points three and five, a weak oblique shock wave exists and the solution can be got from the appropriate section of the theta beta Mach number chart. The flow behind the shock in this region is supersonic. At point 5, the shock is infinitely weak and effectively acts as a Mach wave. This basically indicates that this region is so far away from the object that its influence is negligible. Much of the discussion till now was regarding 2D planar shock waves and applies to geometries like 2D wedges. However, for 3D geometries like a cone, this discussion cannot be applied directly. This is because the flow behind a shock in the case of a 3D geometry is not uniform. For a supersonic flow over a cone, the shock also takes the shape of a cone. As shown here, a streamline representing the flow through the shock cone will start curving behind the shock and eventually becomes parallel to the cone's surface. This is in contrast to what we see with the wedge, where the streamlines and the flow are parallel to the surface immediately behind the oblique shock. Furthermore, for the same flow conditions and the deflection angle, the shock angle for a cone is lesser than that of the wedge. That is, the shock is weaker for the cone. This is because the flow is three-dimensional and can move in any direction to avoid being obstructed by the body. This phenomenon is generally referred to as the three-dimensional relieving effect. A cone can be simply considered as a ray originating from the vertex of the cone. The flow properties can be assumed to be constant along each ray and vary only between the different rays. Flows that satisfy this assumption are called conical flows. The ordinary differential equation shown here is called the taylor mccall equation and is used for finding the solution for conical flows. With that, we will wrap up this lesson.